What would happen if only one of SLS's solid rocket boosters ignited? When do we expect humans will land on the moon again? How long will it take SpaceX to repair the orbital launch site in Starbase? You have questions? We have answers. It's a Q&A episode. Roll, roll the, roll the thing. Howdy space fans, Jack here with NSF, and we're trying something a little different on this one. A little while back we asked our members if they had any questions for us, and we took that list of questions and added in a bunch of questions that we typically get on live streams but don't always have the time to answer. And bingo! Here we are. We had a lot of great questions come our way, so buckle up as we talk about Starship, Moon and Mars plans, Starlink, the future of the ISS, and even a little bit about ourselves. Alright, first up is Alex. Well. You know my name already probably, it's very long, Alejandro Alcantarilla Romera. I write all sorts of things for NSF, um, from scripts to articles and things like that. I also appear on live streams as well, so you probably know my name, know my face, my, my voice and everything. So hello, I'm also doing this thing, so let's get right into it. We'll start with this first question from Kenny about how much work is needed at the Starship orbital launch pad after the first launch. So, you know, there's a lot of things that they need to do there because, you know, they have to put all the deluge stuff in the plates, the sandwich of steel plates there to be able to run all the cooling systems and everything. They also need to improve all of the other systems that they were already a little bit janky for the first flight so yeah the, the second flight is gonna be very nice and tidy for that next we have a question from felicia raptor it's sort of a crazy one about what would happen if only one of sls's solid rocket boosters ignited at liftoff i think the short answer is very bad things i'll let alex answer the longer one well i have one advice for you if you are actually there watching the launch duck and cover <laughs> and run Run very far away. <laughs> I I do not think there's there's an actual procedure in that case. It's just you know it's failure. All right, let's do another question. This one's from Maxim Holman. So for me, it just started with documentaries. We got cable TV when I was young, and you know all these documentaries back when they were not about aliens, and it was all about space and you know galaxies and things like that. I fell in love with 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 astronomy and astrophysics, so I dug into all of the space stuff, you know, spacecraft, rockets, and things like that. So that's how I came into all, all of this stuff that was around 20, 2008, 2009. And since then, I've been, you know, digging, digging even more, even more. And until I reached SpaceX uh, about eight years ago, and since then, I've been following SpaceX that way. Next up, Seth Chance is asking about the possibility of Starship delivering the gateway to lunar orbit? I guess that's a fair question, but no, or at least not yet, <laughs> probably. Um, it's gonna be delivered first by a, a Falcon Heavy. It's gonna deliver the first two modules of the lunar gateway, and then the other two, because it's just gonna be four modules in total, it's gonna be delivered by SLS on two SLS Block 1B um, rockets that's going to be artemis 4 and artemis 5. next up hacko is asking about plans for a second launch tower at starbase and i guess the answer is a clear yes the only issue is that we don't know when or even where because they have a lot of different locations depending on what paperwork you look at and even what renders you look at but definitely yes they have plans for that we just don't know when Owen is asking about the shorter chopsticks at LC-39A in Florida and what that means for that launch pad. No, it's the same distance, it's just that at Starbase, the chopsticks there are longer and so they, they hang for farther away than you know the ones at, at, at 39A at Kennedy Space Center. Those are just shorter and the, their end is really where they need to be for lifting and catching boosters and, and chips. Connor has a question about how fast SpaceX can turn around a pad in between launches at LC-39A and Slick 40 in Florida. That is a fair question because you know you have all of, all of these things to, to refurbish between launches and the minimum that they have been able to do on LC-39A it's a little bit short from nine days and for Slick 40 it's a little bit over five days. Now um, how faster can they do that? It's probably a couple of days more fast, or faster I guess, but not that faster. We have one more question for Alex. This one is from Jack, not this Jack. 
They're asking about how many flights a Falcon 9 first stage booster can fly before it needs to be scrapped. Well, Elon said a while ago that they can actually fly them hundreds of times structurally from the sense of the booster tankage and things like that. But you have a lot of components that you have to replace, right? Every maybe 10, 20 flights. So in theory, you could probably fly them a lot of times, like hundreds and hundreds of times. But eventually you need to replace you know, things like valves, engines, components like that that eventually wear out a lot rather than the tanks themselves. All right, great answers, Alex. Thank you for that. Now we'll talk to Ian, who has some answers of his own. Hey, I'm Ian Atkinson, writer and reporter with NASA Spaceflight. All right, Ian's going to start us off with a question from David99J, asking about Falcon 9's entry burn. And answer your question first off, the re-entry heating would be much hotter. And that comes back to the whole point of the entry burn. Of course it does slow the first stage down a little bit, and that does help a little, but the main purpose is to use the engine's exhaust as a sort of makeshift fiery heat shield. This actually dates back to a concept that NASA studied called supersonic retropropulsion, where you use your engine's exhaust as a heat shield to push away the re-entry heating, and it's worked successfully on almost 200 Falcon landings, protecting the booster from the worst of atmospheric re-entry. Next up, we have Astro Boogie asking if Starlink V2 has had any changes made to it to alter its brightness, which of course can have an effect on astronomy. And the answer is yes. SpaceX is experimenting with a few new coatings on the Starlink V2 mini satellites to try to make them less reflective and appear less bright in the night sky. These mainly come down to adding less reflective material to the back of the solar panels, to the antennas, and things like that. We actually talked in depth about this with Dr. Jonathan McDowell about a month ago. That interview is available right now for our channel members. Now at the Harry Channel 2016 has a rather interesting question about whether SLS can be used without a second stage. And the answer is yes, it is very much possible. And it's something NASA actually studied. So back in the early days of SLS around 2011 or 2012, they studied a concept known as block zero, which would have had no upper stage, a shorter core stage, four segment solid rocket boosters instead of five, and only three RS-25 engines on the core stage. This would be able to get around 70 to 80 metric tons of payload into low Earth orbit, which it's not really anything to scoff at, but there's just no need to get anything like that just into low Earth orbit. Also, the high price tag that would come along with that made it kind of unnecessary. It was thrown around as an idea to get Orion to the International Space Station, but then commercial crew came along and there's really no need for that nowadays. Next up, Jack, not this Jack once again, is asking if the DoD's Starshield is using Starlink satellites. And the answer is yes. Starshield is closely derived from the Starlink satellites that fly today. However, Starshield is more tailored towards government customers, uh, so things that need to be encrypted or classified and they don't really want you to see. From what SpaceX has published, it seems that Starshield is based mostly around the V2 mini satellite bus. However, they've also stated the buses are modular, so it could be different shapes depending on what the customer wants. Um, however, like I said, they may be classified, so we may or may not ever see what they actually end up looking like. All right, the last question we have for Ian before moving on is a question from Cubic about whether ULA's Vulcan rocket will be human rated. And that's a good question. So Starliner currently flies on Atlas V, which is human rated. However, Boeing only has six operational flights of Starliner booked on Atlas V, and they can't book any more because Atlas V is ending production. So Vulcan seems like the logical successor to that. However, ULA has said that they currently have no plans to human rate Vulcan. Of course, that could change in the future, but that's currently the stance that ULA has on crew rating Vulcan. Next up, me. All right, I'll just let myself talk. Next question is from Origami Salami 7. They're asking if we enjoy bringing the nerds of the world amazing rocket footage. And the, I mean, the easy answer is yes, but we do say it on streams when people do the super chats or what have you, or when people just say nice things in a comment uh, or a question, we really mean it. Like doing what we do is such a fun job. We feel extremely lucky to be able to do it. And a good chunk of the fun of what we do is yes, we get to witness rocket launches, which is amazing. But on the other hand, we also get to share that excitement with everybody else, which sort of compounds the excitement. Like I have done things and I have shot things that I, you know, I can't talk about because it's for a company or for whatever reason. Um, and those things are fun and special in their own way. And I'm not trying to hate on those or anything, but those experiences have made me realize how much a joy and how much a component of my enjoyment 
it is to share the things that I'm witnessing happening with everybody on the internet. That is a huge, huge part of the fun. Um, I would even go as far as to say maybe more than 50% of the fun, but at least 50% of the fun. So yes, I can at least speaking for myself and I'm sure basically everybody else on the team, we love bringing you guys amazing footage, which is part of the reason we're so thankful for all the support because we want to continue to do that. We want to continue to up our game and bring you even more, even better, even cooler footage. So that's why we're so thankful when we get the super chats and everything. I didn't mean for this to turn into a super chat, thanks on a not even a live stream, but for real, the reason we're so appreciative of all the support and kind words is because we love doing this and we wanna keep doing it and we wanna keep doing it even better. So thank you for the good question there, Origami Salami 7. Dark Robin is asking, what's our target year for the first Starship mission to Mars? I'm gonna say 2030, just because I've always said 2030. It's a nice round number. There's no actual transfer window in 2030. I think there's one in 2029. So maybe they launch in 2029 and arrive in 2030 or something like that. I don't know, I'm not really thinking this completely through, but just what feels right, like holistically to me, would be a Mars landing in 2030. It's a nice round number. It would be appropriate. It would start the new decade off right. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna say 2030. Ross is asking if there's any plans for a lunar base or if it's just straight on to Mars, let's concentrate on that. Um, I don't remember seeing any specific plans, but I do believe that there are plans for a permanent human settlement to exist on the surface of the moon and not just orbiting around it. And that's part of the reason why NASA selected Starship for a lunar lander, even though it's massively oversized, it will do the things and enable the things that allow us to have a settlement on the surface of the moon. So it's kind of like stepping stones, like moon now, then Mars. We started off with the ISS, um, you know, so you can sort of see the crawl, walk, run type progression. But I don't remember seeing any specific plans, but I could just be woefully out of date. And the other thing about the moon is it has lots of liquid water. So in theory, if you wanted to make a propellant depot on the moon somehow for Starship, you could mine the lunar water and then have a Starship come into lunar orbit, maybe dock with a tanker that's refined some propellant from the surface of the moon and refuel that way rather than having to, you know, launch five or six different tanker Starships over the course of however long and fuel up a Starship in low Earth orbit that way. Although I do think for a Starship to get from low Earth orbit to the moon, it would have to be refueled. So maybe you just refuel it in low Earth orbit enough to get to the moon and then uh, at the moon itself, it refuels enough to get to Mars. But that's all very, who knows, I'm just completely speculating here, but could happen. Weiger is asking about the new logo right here, new logo. Uh, why shuttle? Because NSF started out as a shuttle focused website and we transitioned to from NASA spaceflight to NSF. And as part of that rebranding to make us kind of more modern and hip and a cooler logo, uh, we put the shuttle in the logo because we wanted to show sort of, you know, show our roots, where we came from. We started off focusing on the shuttle and thank goodness so much has happened in the last 17 or so years that now, you know, obviously the shuttle's retired, but we wanted to sort of have a bit of a throwback in the logo. So that's the reason for the shuttle in the new logo. Lars asks what time frame we expect the American people to land back on the moon. I'm only talking for myself here, but I want to say in the 2026, 2028 time frame and once again, similar to my Mars answer, hopefully that's not hopelessly optimistic in retrospect, but now that I think about it, 2026 to 2028 in that time frame really makes Mars 2030 look kind of soon. We'll put it that way. Um, but all you gotta do is kind of cross your fingers and hope at this point and we see some rapid progress in the coming years. Curtis is asking with Phobos and Deimos, the two oil rigs that SpaceX had purchased and then sold, having been sold, uh, if we think SpaceX will ever launch from an offshore platform. I'm never gonna say no, like certainly not ever, but if point to point becomes a thing, I could see the offshore platform aspect of Starship becoming much more uh, of a necessary thing. You know, you don't wanna just blast a rocket straight into a city center, but if you can con connect um, rapid transit to an offshore platform, or like with a ferry service connected to a subway or a train, train station or some sort of setup like that, uh, you could probably get away with, um, you know, an off offshore platform and then hopefully the, the time it takes to travel to and from the platform to the mainland or what have you doesn't negate the speed of a Starship launch, you know, point to point. But I think they become really important with point to point. They certainly early on uh, when we found out about them and up until we found out they were sold seemed like a hedge against uh, the FAA and environmental hurdles that could have been thrown up in Boca Chica. Um, you know, if they can't launch in Boca Chica, they can't launch at Kennedy Space Center. Heck, we'll do it on an oil platform in international waters. But uh, thankfully that ended up not being necessary. And it seems like, yeah, it could totally happen, but it's more of a something out in the future sort of thing. Maxine is asking what our background is with space knowledge. Again, I'm only speaking for myself here, but uh, for me, I started off as a kid who was obsessed about trains and then that quickly got me obsessed about planes. 
and really all sorts of technological advancements and marvels. And of course that includes the space program. So I was a kid that wanted to grow up and be an astronaut. I even wanted to be in the Air Force for a period of time, you know, become a pilot and try and go that whole route. But uh, yeah, various life factors conspired to make that not happen for me. But thankfully, I'm completely happy where I'm at. But all that is to say, I am one of those people that sort of stereotypically started off as a space nerd as a kid. Uh, in like late middle school through high school, I kind of stopped caring about it quite as much. Um, and then in the time frame of college to after college, I started getting back into it as things in the space program started picking back up. I mean, I remember being at work, uh, I was working on a reality TV show out in Orlando, Florida, and the last shuttle flew on STS-135. And I remember sort of having everybody pause work for a second to look at the shuttle and be like, oh, look, it's the last one um, before going back to work. I wish I could have been, you know, up close and personal for that, but uh, but that is sort of around the end of the shuttle when SpaceX things started picking up in, the, in that couple year time frame is when I started uh, rediscovering my love of all things aerospace. And, you know, I just always sort of been an information sponge and soaked up whatever knowledge I can. Um, some friends in high school used to call me Pocket Fact Jack because I would just have random facts about random things because um, I like to learn things. So that sort of transitioned into me learning about space ad nauseum and annoying all my friends with space facts and then that somehow materialized into a thing that actually I can do as a job. So there you go. All right, finally, we've got still more great questions for our last expert in this video, Ryan. Ryan, take it away. Hello, I'm Ryan, host and editor for NSF. All right, we'll start with a question from Ian about the future of the space station. The ISS is a collaborative project between the US, Russia, ESA, Japan, Canada, and various other international partners. So it's important to clarify that the decision is not just NASA's. There are multiple international factors into the decision to end the ISS program with it re-entry. It's quite expensive to operate and in the nicest way possible it's starting to show its age. For example, the interior of China's new Tiangong space station is much cleaner compared to the ISS. The next few decades of space exploration are looking to deep space, notably the Moon and Mars, and this tune is being sung by everybody everywhere. NASA, Canada and ESA have the Artemis program and China and Russia are working on their own lunar goals. Private companies like SpaceX are then looking beyond Mars, so being stuck in low Earth orbit isn't really of interest anymore. To replace the ISS, NASA is helping to fund new, modern commercial stations in low Earth orbit, such as Axiom Station and Orbital Reef. The Axiom Station is starting its life as an addition to the ISS, so by a technicality, the ISS is kind of living on as a US-only station, but it's a commercial station. NASA also has the Lunar Gateway, which will be a collaboration between Canada, ESA and NASA, like a mini moon-based ISS. Next up, Mary is asking about International Space Station mission numbers. So what I believe you're asking here is what triggers a new expedition, which is basically a formal way of denoting an ISS crew. Each expedition has a commander who is the commander of the ISS. They're numbered sequentially, so Expedition 1 was the first crew to occupy the station back in 2000, and at the time of writing, we've reached Expedition 69. Normally, they last around six months as they follow the Russian crew rotations. For example, the last Expedition, 68, started with the departure of Soyuz MS-21 and ended with the departure of Soyuz MS-22. Nowadays, it's common for non-Russian crews to stay on board throughout an expedition boundary, especially with continuous crewed flights from SpaceX and soon Boeing. And finally, looking at a future beyond the ISS, Daniel is asking about international involvement in the Artemis program. Yes, it is possible, because it's the plan. Not only will NASA be bringing the first woman and the first person of colour to the lunar surface, but the Canadian Space Agency will be taking the first Canadian. A Japanese astronaut will be coming along for the ride on a future Artemis mission, and ESA has three seats reserved for their astronauts, but because only the crew of Artemis 2 has been announced knowing who and when is impossible. All right, thank you everyone for the great questions. If this video does well, maybe we'll do some more of these. So if you have any questions, ask them in the comments or you know what to do, tweet at us or ask on live streams, you know the deal.